Hey, Fit Heads. Today we have Nathan Lazinski, and I'm going to just have to read over how much <laughs> this guy knows. He's a doctor of chiropractic, certified strength and conditioning specialist, a board certified in therapeutic massage and body work, uh, fascial movement, chiropractor. He's given me a full body massage. He's, oh yeah, and he's so into CrossFit and super fit. He has huge pecs, as you will see in this one. <laughs> Oh, and if you were listening, this is definitely one to switch over to YouTube, unless you're driving, then wait. <laughs> but he shows us stuff. He has a spine uh, separate from the spine that's in his body, and, <laughs> and he shows us body positioning things. So this is definitely one to watch for the visuals. Yeah, I mean, it was, it's one to watch. When he pulled out that spine, that was the funniest <laughs> thing in the world. He was like, ah, here, I'll just show you on this spine. And we're both like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he talks a lot about it got it was really fun it got very little medical a little quick i really liked it a lot a lot of fascia yeah, yeah. talk don't get yeah. it don't get that every day um it was it was just so cool to see like an, an insight from somebody who has like the chiropractic medical body sort of physiology all the degrees and stuff that were pretty blatant behind his, <laughs> on his yeah. wall but then also to see someone who works out a lot himself crossword level three trainer sure. like to actually take this stuff seriously and like has that ability to marry the um coaching and and teaching and knowledge uh, i thought that was really fun too welcome to total fitness serious fitness for not so serious people <laughs> welcome nate thank you so much for joining us uh hey thanks for having me we think we might have a decent amount of delay here. Also, a decent amount of credentials behind you. What's going on there? <laughs> well, it just started off as kind of like a collection. I just wanted to see how many letters I could get after my name. And then somewhere along the lines, through all that process, I kept getting smarter and smarter. So look <laughs> at me now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're also, what, a CrossFit level one and weightlifting coach. I didn't even know that that existed. I mean, I guess for sure. Yeah, I've actually got a couple weightlifting certifications, including uh, you saw USA weightlifting level one and also the CrossFit weightlifting, which is based off of Mike Bergener, who's down um, around San Diego area. And also not to correct you, but I am on CrossFit level, level two, two and I'm Got studying it. to take on CrossFit level three, which will be in less Ooh. than a month. So, you know, let's just get that all straightened out. Solid. Okay. Sorry. Wait, how you're studying? Jeez. This, so they get harder, I'm guessing, as you move up because level one was like you had a weekend. Yeah, they, they do indeed. Exactly. And the same thing with level two. Level three is actually everything there in CrossFit, whether it be masters, L1, L2, kids, nutrition, scaling, adaptive, everything. And then they're in also anatomy, physiology, different terms, even a little bit of like uh, sociology, a bunch of stuff. So there's a lot of stuff. It's basically a one four hour test um, where you go to a national test taking center and you take it as opposed to just a weekend course. Dang. That's, I feel like it's super rare that you find a a chiropractor that is that deep in CrossFit. Huh. I agree. I agree. But I love it because that helps me to treat my patients even, even better. I treat mostly active people. I also treat people that are striving to become more active. Um, so in the process there, I get to share my knowledge and my personal experience, my anecdotal experience to help people like create the best uh, uh, experience for them and also just to make sure that they can perform to their fullest potential. Yeah, I can't imagine going to someone that doesn't know their stuff like that now. I have a fat chiropractor that's trying to tell me how to take care of my body. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Have you found that CrossFitters have like a specific, like unique types of problems compared to the average person? That, that is kind of across the board for CrossFit? Yeah, you know what? Yes, absolutely. Um, because it takes a different kind of mindset to participate in CrossFit. Typically, we're type A and we're highly competitive. And so with that becomes the, uh, the, the need to succeed. And in doing so, sometimes the people try to ignore the signals that their bodies are sending, sending them. 
and that can lead to uh, injury and poor performance. But, you know, it can spiral out of control and lead to much worse things. So, yeah, typically we see in CrossFit a lot of shoulder stuff, to be honest with you. That's probably number one. Um, and then we've got like low back, of course, and knees, typically. I deal with all of that. Interesting that like shoulders, the biggest problem, I guess, I don't know, overhead speed and overhead is not usual with other types of working out or, or is it, you're, I don't you're know. Right. Yeah, what, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Think it Max, if you well, it could be, but also that the shoulder is the, the most mobile joint in the body. Yeah. Shoulders are, I think, tough for a lot of people and a lot of people aren't doing a lot of overhead weight stuff. It's not quite as common. And certainly that's one of the like another, a lot of other sports, they don't have, you're not exactly holding something over your head. You're not stressing. You're not even walking on your hands upside down or anything ridiculous yeah. like that. Um, but shoulder flex, like I know um, shoulders are tough for a lot of people because there's a lot of mini sort of, there's a lot of mini, mini tears that you can easily mess up your shoulders. I, I tore my labrum. Um, and so I had about a well, I mean, they still do it, but I have years and years of those five pound weights just doing little, <laughs> the rotator cuff exercises and you <laughs> look and feel so stupid. Uh, but it's, you know, it's one of those things where flexibility and stability and stuff like that, you have to take good care of. How do you find, um, wh what do you prescribe to sh for shoulder people, <laughs> for people with no shoulders? It's like yeah, in football when they're like, oh, he's out, he's out with a knee. <laughs> Like, yeah, I know he's got a knee, but like, what's wrong with it? <laughs> right. <laughs> sure. It's definitely multifactorial. One of the biggest things I would say is that, well, the, the shoulder's the most mobile joint in the body and that comes at a cost and that has to do with stability. So um, there's, there's a couple of different things. Emotions, One so. being that, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so aside from all of the working out that we're doing there's also just the postural habits of how we're holding ourselves in our daily life and i can certainly argue that the way that we're holding our bodies throughout our day is killing us okay and it just has a lot to do with just not knowing all right yeah. because you can go and you can work your body you work your shoulders at the gym but if you're already walking around holding it in different parts of your of your chest and obviously your shoulder as well then when you go to the gym, it's just going to magnify, it's going to amplify it, and then that'll obviously lead to further injury. Especially if every day is chest day, like me. <laughs> I only bench. <laughs> that, Actually, <laughs> does does like pull ups and back workouts help with that, or is it, or is that like misguided for me to think that like getting better at deadlifts and, and that type of thing would help my posture. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And you are right. You're not misguided. It has to do with the antagonistic muscles. So if everything's tight on this side, we want to have everything back there, try to pull it back there. But here's the thing is that it'll slowly continue to keep cinching down on one side and then the other. Furthermore, one of the biggest components that a lock of the shoulder, believe it or not, is your lat, but up and close to the shoulder area, there's actually the teres minor and the teres major. The teres minor actually has to do with, she's like, where is it? <laughs> I know I grabbed it on you before and I'll grab yeah. it on you next time I see you too. Yeah. <laughs> so the teres minor needs to be lax enough to be able to have the head of the humerus descend, slide down a little bit. Mm. So. So by working uh, your back, you're tightening up through here, and then you're also going to be tightening the front, so everything just kind of cinches down from there. So yes, it's good to work front and back, but it's going to be really important just to make sure you're keeping all of the soft tissue supple, if you will. Okay, interesting. Mm. Oh, to give the fit head some insights, I went to Nathan, the first, that was my first time with a chiropractor, and I filmed it all so you can see him like cracking <laughs> my back and... I don't know, releasing muscles that I didn't know I had. <laughs> and that's coming to this channel in, uh, <laughs> on Monday. I, I definitely lo loved it. It feels like working out. Like I need to do it consistently to get better at it. With, like get better at you adjusting me. I don't know what that means, but like just that I need to stick with it to like mm -hmm. see long-term changes. Yeah, absolutely. And what you're experiencing is actually a central nervous system. Um, basically, when you come to me the first time, your brain, even on a sub 
subconscious level is like, who the hell is this guy? You're going to be in a sympathetic <laughs> state, which is fight or flight. Yeah. You, you didn't want to fight me, so that's good. You might have wanted to run away, but you stayed, okay? So then with repeated, with repeated <laughs> visits, then your, your uh, brain will go into more of a parasympathetic state, which means you're able to rest and receive the recovery and the therapy even better. And that's where you can really receive the exponential benefit of the therapy. Interesting. Is it crazy that I kind of felt like fatigued after? I mean, I did do a, like a workout before I went to you, but I just felt like extra kind of worn out. But all I did was lay there while you like poked at me. <laughs> Without a doubt. Yeah. <laughs> to say the least, poked yeah. up. Uh, yeah, that's perfectly normal. And that okay. has to do with actually how we, how we um, live our lives. So as we get different insults throughout our day, and create different stresses on our body, we're gonna manifest that and hold our body in certain ways, whether it be like stress or even just like how we're leaning and posturing. And so what'll happen is that the muscles in your body will actually turn on and engage as you're experiencing different emotions. And then what happens is that your brain forgets that it's turned on. And so you'll continue your day and sometimes you'll have this muscle turned on for weeks or months at a time where it's just super tight. It's called hypertonic. And so what will happen is when I get in there and I find all of these muscles that are hypertonic and I tap them, sometimes it just takes a little bit of touch. Sometimes it'll take five seconds of touching a certain muscle and your brain's going, wait, why is that still on? And then it'll release it. So that's what you're <laughs> feeling is that everything's so tight like this. And then I get it to all relax at the same time. And then it's kind of like a, Ugh. you know, everything's not so rigid anymore. So that's probably what you're experiencing. Yeah. Uh, Max, have you ever gone to a chiropractor? No, uh, it's scares, scary. I watched about four hours of chiropractor <laughs> cracking videos last night. And that is like a whole new rabbit hole. It is <laughs> fun mm -hmm. and like freaky at the same time. <laughs> What is, what is the cracking sound? What is that? <laughs> yeah, well, it's actually a nitrogen release that's between all of your joints. But the important thing about like finding the most ideal chiropractor is that they're doing a hell of a lot more than just adjusting. Adjusting is a very powerful tool, um, but it should be used in conjunction with other things. In particular, you need to do soft tissue therapy with it because your, your muscles are gonna be holding your body a certain way that will be pulling different bones out of alignment, which can lead to uh, ineffective functionality, okay? So the popping itself, sometimes uh, uh, bones will articulate and adjust without a pop, you know? So, so yeah, just make sure that when you're, when you're in the hunt for a chiropractor, make sure they're not just adjusting because you're going to need the whole package. Mm -hmm. uh, can, you, can you stay on the record that I can then send to my grandma that it's okay that I crack my knuckles? Or is that, or my fingers going to fall <laughs> off? Like my grandma uh, said. That's a great... <laughs> on the record. <laughs> you know what? Crack your knuckles. Whoa, Crack okay. your knuckles, it's okay. <laughs> because again, what's, what's happening... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, now it's different though. You know, different people... So cracking your knuckles is just going to be releasing the natural buildup of nitrogen between your joints. Now there's a big stretch, a big leap from going from cracking your knuckles to say cracking your neck, or even like doing a little twisty cracking your back. Those are a big time no-go. Do not do that because what you're doing is you're usually just articulating one or two joints and then the joints above and below it aren't moving and that can lead to severe dysfunction because in between your vertebra are oh, nice. discs, yes which are these guys right here <laughs> if you're just listening you gotta you're come like, see this on youtube you're gonna bust it out <laughs> <laughs> yeah so these these little intervertebral discs right here they don't have a heart pumping nutrients to them okay mm -hmm. They actually get their nutrients by this process called imbibition, and that means that it's moving. So it needs to move, and then what happens is your interstitial fluid gets in there, brings fresh oxygen and nutrients in the form of fluid, all right? So when you're popping your own neck or popping your own back, it's usually just like the same one or two spots. The spots above it and the spots below it aren't moving. So what does that mean? 
that means that these joints aren't getting imbibed and that means that they're slowly getting closer and closer as this intervertebral disc is deteriorating okay so you don't want to do that so don't pop your neck or your back okay well that's a little thumbs up thumbs down situation <laughs> wait i've never cracked my knuckles right. ever in my life does that mean that i have like years old nitrogen that i need to get rid of oh that's interesting no there will be a natural slow release in it okay. um but that's that's a good question too <laughs> can you talk a little bit about um the body how the body works as a whole because i know a lot of times people think like oh um why does my hip hurt and it turns out like they have the wrong sneakers and i think that uh, one thing that a lot of people get lost mm -hmm. on is that it's like one thing leads into another leads into another like I saw a video last night where she pushed on, I don't know, she adjusted something and she was like, I feel it in my opposite hand. And I think it's, I think that's sort of lost on a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, have, have you seen that or am I, do I need more yeah. degrees to make that distinction? <laughs> Absolutely. Without a doubt. No. <laughs> no, no, no. I see it every single day. And it's actually a couple different things going on there. One, we've got these things called trigger points, AKA knots, okay? And these trigger points can either be active or passive. When they're active, they let you know that they're there in the form of pain, okay? But the thing about trigger point pain is that it refers to a multitude of different areas. In fact, one interesting case in point, you go to the podiatrist, they do MRI, they do X-ray, they do this, and there's nothing. Everything looks perfectly normal, and that's because that pain is coming from your hip. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is one example of trigger point referral. Another great trigger point referral is uh, that on your, on your shoulder, there's your scapula. On the back of your scapula, there's your infraspinatus. And then on the inside of your, of your scapula, it's called your subscapularis. When you get trigger points through here, it'll actually refer all the way down through here. So you could be saying, I've got shoulder pain over through here. I've got tricep pain. And it's not going to be addressed if you start looking right here, because it's actually going to be very deep in there. But again, there's countless examples of trigger point pain referrals all over your body, okay? So that's just one example of how you can manifest this pain in other places of your body that you, that you realize that it's coming from. The other example is this stuff called fascia. Have you ever heard of that word? Yeah. I did because you told me when I went right. in. Well, <laughs> <let> me... <laughs> yes. Well, you're about to hear all about it again. Um, hopefully this is, <laughs> still sounds familiar to you okay so basically this fascia is a really amazing thing that's a uh, part of your uh your whole anatomy is that it's one of the first places to first things to develop embryologically okay so basically as you're developing as an embryo this fascia starts developing so then everything else that develops after it this fascia is wrapped around all right so as I like to tell my patients, imagine a human skeleton, and then on that skeleton, put all the muscles, and now imagine a white connective tissue uh, coming and completely encapsulating the whole body. It's like a glove on the outside of your body, but actually, more importantly, it's like a 3D spider web throughout your entire body. So it's wrapped around every vein, artery, nerve, muscle, organ. Everything's connected with this spider web of fascia. So the fascia is important because it helps with movement and it does that by dispersing water so that fascia wants to glide like this with every time we move but then through different uh insults to your body whether it be posture stress hydration nutrition working out that fascia that should be gliding like this will get stuck and then it doesn't want to move all right and that's called the fascial adhesion but here's the thing um even though that's stuck we still want to be able to do the things we're used to like tie our shoe or reach overhead. So then what happens is that we start compensating with other parts of the body so that we can accomplish these things. So fascia. So I wanna go back to this real quick. This is like a 2D model of that mm -hmm. fascia, but I actually think about it more like a 3D model. So as it goes, and then it gets adhered, and then it binds down. So then we can kind of see this on the front of most people's bodies, and gravity also helps with that. Everything gets locked in kind of like that. Okay, now when this happens, it can be pulling on different fascial uh, sites throughout your body. So you could be pulling uh, from your hip and it's coming from your shoulder or something like that. That's what I do as a chiropractor is I'm gonna treat all of these uh, spots along your body that are, gonna, that are all connected. 
Yeah, I came up with the term Mr. Burnsing for this situation in case you wanted to use that. It's not excellent. <laughs> yeah, I seem to like, I, I don't sit that much. I mean, I'm at my computer, but I, I was thinking that with all my pull-ups and my stretching five minutes at night that I was like compensating for all of my computering but I, that i'm realizing that's not the case <laughs> mm, yeah it's not your fault is that once that fascia adheres on itself it takes a lot to get it to move again so do you i need to go and see you can i do stretches at home should i get a foam roller or a lacrosse ball or should i get someone to walk on my back how do we what are we doing or here? a theragun should i just jump off a bridge <laughs> or a ther <laughs> <laughs> there's no hope <laughs> uh no it goes, that's an excellent question so there is absolutely self-maintenance that you or anybody can do like you just said their guns fantastic uh, lacrosse ball foam roller somebody walking on you sure but there's a lot that can be that can be missed and that's why you need the help of a highly skilled body worker me or there's a lot of people qualified obviously too that can go in there and it's kind of like a deep cleaning you know getting in there qualified. and making sure that all of the fascia all everybody right <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but nearly nearly there yeah yeah, yeah. by getting does, in there um, kind of like doing the the deep cleaning of your body does diet have anything to do with should i drink more pineapple juice or something you know what that's an excellent question just water because it does, hey. it disperses that water. So a lot of times when we start getting dehydrated, it'll bind down and I'll <laughs> sure. I'll tell you what, anything that's not caffeinated uh -oh. or, or sweetened with sugar and you <laughs> like to drink it, go ahead. Go right ahead. Because okay. it's better than nothing. And I please excuse me all the vegans, but it's classic, like I want you to think about a piece of beef jerky versus a steak that you would see at the grocery store, okay? And so the steak at the store is very hydrated. The beef jerky Dehydrate. is not. Yeah. So just reflect on this right now and see where what you think your, your muscle suppleness is like along those uh -oh. lines of hydration. What about, yeah, supplements? <laughs> do, Big you, trouble. do you suggest anything <laughs> besides water, obviously? Sure, That's yeah, sure. absolutely. It's nearly impossible to completely <laughs> I won't then. <laughs> um, uh, it's nearly it's nearly impossible to to uh, ingest everything that's beneficial for our body. So there are some natural supplements that I do take. Uh, um, I don't know if I I don't want to say this one supplement's name, but I have this supplement that actually is what you've heard about before, like such as like Botswana turmeric. Uh, devil's claw something something it's this this conglomeration where it's, a, it's all this anti-inflammatory stuff that's natural to your body that i'll certainly supplement with that and if i can i'll touch base with you later and i can tell you who the manufacturer is um but i highly recommend at least that also i supplement with collagen every morning in my coffee because you know i have to have coffee so collagen is really important too, because that's going to help a lot of your joints, also helps your hair grow. It's doing great for me. <laughs> and uh, also your nails, <laughs> organs, joints. Yeah. So um, I would what, say how many grams collagen, of collagen and then some sort of like, uh, you know what? I, I can't remember the dose on the top of my head, but it's just it's basically funny. one scoop. I yeah, put okay, one scoop in my coffee. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I was doing that because I was having knee pain, but... Mm -hmm. I feel like the a uh, like bigger solution to that would be to go to you and then maybe add the supplements in. <laughs> I mean, absolutely, yeah, because there could be an underlying soft tissue uh, problem, in particular with the knee pain. What I see a lot of times is definitely uh, rectus femoris, which is the deepest one of your quads. But also, knee pain is very, very cool and complicated because. What I like to say is like, uh, let me see if I can describe this. Sorry. So say this is your patella on the front of your knee and here's your, like your femur and your tibias down here. Basically everywhere in your body has got constant tugs of wars going on. So as your femur and your quad are getting tight, it's wanting to pull this up 
but then down here, your tibialis anterior wants to pull this down. So right away, we're having this going on, okay? Then we've got all of our adductors on the inside of your thigh, and on the outside of your thigh, you've got your IT band, obviously, which is also works in correlation with your TFL. So now we've got this trying to pull your patella this way, and then we've got your IT band trying to pull it this way. And then, as if that was enough tugs of warring going on, we've also got your whole front or anterior of your leg being pulled by the back of your leg and your hamstring and even your popliteal muscle and your, and your gastrox. So basically, your poor knee is being pulled <laughs> this way, this way, that way, that way, that way, that way, that way. And then pain manifests in different spots. So if you were facing me, and again, if this is your femur coming up and your tibia coming down, sometimes it'll manifest down in the lower part um, near your tibial tuberosity. And this can be called patellofemoral pain syndrome, which is PFPS, poof, poof, as we like to call it in the industry. I'm just kidding. We don't call it that. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I call it that to my, my business for sure because it's just a fun word to say. That's awesome. So anyway, so yeah, so knee pain, what we need to do is loosen everything up, okay, because it's being pulled in whatever direction and some ways and more than the other. So to help with knee pain, we just loosen it up. Or just make it equally tight perfectly in each direction. Yeah. Just, yeah, it makes me feel like so you don't have to squat or anything. It makes me surprised that the whole world doesn't have knee pain when you describe it like that. Jeez, and you're also yeah, it's am fascinating. Among all of those credentials, is like a functional movement screen or whatever. I like you can also because I'm guessing my knee pain is probably because I'm not balanced or like moving incorrectly. So you can like diagnose that kind of thing? Absolutely. Yeah, it's very cool. It's like the wave of the future, even though this has been around for a long time now, functional movement screening. Basically, it's like old fashioned chiropractors would take an x-ray to see where your joints, what your joints look like. All right. And when you take an x-ray to look at a joint, you're basically seeing like the one one thousandth of a second the way that joint is being held. So the second you breathe, it's going to move, all right? So you, it's, it's not fair to the patient to try to uh, create a whole treatment plan based off of this one one thousandth of a second because they could be turning slightly, they could be angled in their chair a little bit. So what uh, Greg Cook, Lee Burton, um, and Greg Rose came up with, I think at least a decade ago now, is that, um, well, let's, analyze people in our natural environment that is by moving you know so we'll go through the screening process see what works see what looks dysfunctional see if there's any pain and stuff and that way we can diagnose and see how best to treat the body I just can't imagine going to a chiropractor that doesn't have all of these qualifications now i'm so <laughs> impressed and wait you also do rock tape though <laughs> quick question on that is rock tape real or is this <laughs> <laughs> Bull. Oh, you know what? Let me let me put some on you, and then you can answer it. And I'll tell you absolutely yes. There's two different functions uh, that come to my head. There might be an extra one, but two functions that work instantly on rock tape. One, as I told you before, when we start like getting uh, holding our emotions in our body, those muscles become hypertonic. They get turned on. So sometimes when you just take that rock tape and put it on a muscle. What it does is it tactilely reconnects it with your brain. So now your brain knows, hey, let's relax that a little bit, okay? That's one of the functions of rock tape. Another function of rock tape that's really important is that as that rock tape comes onto the skin, and remember that fascia didn't want to move. Now it's going to gently lift that skin up, and now we restore glide. And that's mm. extremely important in knees, shoulders, backs, everywhere. Rock tape is magical. It's, it's amazing. Well, it's huh? different than I expected. <laughs> but like, it seems like <laughs> you need to know what you're doing. I just go slap some on myself, right? Right. But I'm going to, I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of great res resources just on YouTube that'll describe it mm. too. In fact, I think Rock Take makes videos very available on, on YouTube. Another no. tough question. I, I just have these back to back. Is CrossFit terrible for the human body? <laughs> it's quite the opposite, actually. 
it's acceptable for the human really? body because what we're doing, absolutely, we're taking our body through all of our functional movement patterns. That means what we're doing is taking our body through movement patterns that we'll be doing throughout our daily lives. Like the air squat, what do we do with the air squat? It's the same thing as getting off the toilet, okay? So what we're doing is we're going and we're practicing and we're drilling the movement patterns that we use throughout our lives but with the, under the watchful eye of a coach, what you're doing is you're actually increasing your virtuosity. Virtuosity means doing the common uncommonly well. So what we're trying to do is make sure that you can reach overhead uncommonly well, because what we want to do is preserve that for your life. Because if you can't, again, reach overhead uncommonly well, then what's happening is that we're creating dysfunction is going to put different strain on different joints and joint capsules and muscles. What we're doing is we're trying to prolong all of what we've got in our body. And so the best way to do that is make sure that we're doing everything symmetrically, make sure everything's a lot of body mechanics with this. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. CrossFit is amazing. Okay. And it also has to do, there's a lot of different uh, aspects to CrossFit that, but now, now you got me started. So let me tell you about CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> CrossFit's <laughs> well, CrossFit's great. CrossFit's amazing. The movement patterns are there to reproduce um, the movement patterns that we do throughout our daily lives. Then, when we start adding weights to it, um, then what that's going to do is build our muscles to accommodate that movement pattern. Something that we're going to be using every day. So, one of the found, uh, foundational tenets of CrossFit is that. The first thing we're going to do is our mechanics. Are we going to be moving perfectly? We're going to have our virtuosity in those mechanics of the movements. Now we're going to move on to consistency. Can we consistently move perfectly? Okay. And then only after then, if you can move consistently, perfectly, then you start increasing the intensity. So what you're seeing there on a lot of these CrossFit videos is that intensity. And that's the last thing that we're working on, okay, is that intensity. So furthermore, there's this whole other concept too called threshold training. So let's say that we are used to being able to uh, exercise at this fitness level right here, okay? So we've got an X and a Y and all that. If you can, we're going to have story time and imagination time, okay? <laughs> so we're used to working out at this fitness level, all right? So all of this, all of our mechanics are very good and sound. But once we get to the top up through here at our fitness level, they start breaking down. And that's a completely normal process, okay? This is all done with light weights, and, and this is the process. We're going to kiss that uh, threshold, and then we're going to come back down, okay? So day after day of coming up and reaching that threshold, um, our body is going to adapt to that. And as it adapts, then guess what? now it's going to come up a little bit more okay so every day we're reaching that threshold and then it slowly gets better and better and better that way okay but again a lot of this has to do with the coaching all right the coaches need to know what's going on they need to keep a watchful eye they need to be the person's the athlete's advocate because sometimes that athlete doesn't know that their posture and their form and how they're holding their body is a, a recipe for disaster so a lot of that has to do with the responsibility of the coach. So, so I can't say enough about that. Make sure that your coach is always watching, not on a cell phone, not trying to adjust the music, but there to help coach you and give you actionable coaching cues too, because that's how you're going to protect yourself from injury. So what happens in CrossFit is that when you're not guided, when you're not coached, when somebody's not being mindful of that or each individual athlete, then it can slip away. Then all of a sudden the mechanics and consistency go out the window. And now we're trying to move with this high intensity with these dysfunctional movement patterns because we're just used to our bodies are holding us a certain way. Mm -hmm. So that's what you see if somebody's coming in, they're trying to add too much weight or too many reps with an already dysfunctional movement pattern. So what we need to do is make sure we can open them up, make sure that they can create that functional movement pattern repeatedly and then add weight hmm. and then consistency. So. so would you sign my petition to get mirrors put in all CrossFit gyms? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> oh, come on. You have to see your form. <laughs> what, if my, what if my coach isn't telling me? <laughs> Without a doubt. 
<laughs> now that no, that's a good point. If your coach isn't telling you, but here's the thing: Are we walking around throughout our daily lives, being able to look and see what we look like as we're getting up and down, as we're opening the car door, as we're driving? Do we have a mirror right there so that we can use that as a cue for us to do it? No, we've got to rely on our own proprioception or how we're holding our body. Uh... Ah, I never thought about uh, how I need to like <laughs> improve the muscle memory of sitting on the toilet. I want to be a virtuoso <laughs> at it. <laughs> yeah, for our listeners at home, one thing oh, I would go suggest... Ahead and put your mirror in front of the toilet. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I would suggest if you're, if you're wanting to um, improve your posture, if I can humbly suggest something, um, just get really tall friends. And then uh, you'll constantly be like, holy shit, I gotta, I gotta stand up. <laughs> uh, is there a sport that is the worst for your body? I mean, uh, not to generalize here, or like, is there something that you see like tennis players have crappy elbows or baseball players have always have jacked up shoulders or stuff like that? Have you ever, uh, what do you come across? Hmm. That's an excellent question, and I it's going to be very subjective um, because it all depends on how well that person is taking care of their body. So I, I can't generalize, but that said, um, we can also just look at the, the research. And, of course, what they say is, is uh, um, impact sports such as football and hockey are really hard on, on the human body. And lest we forget, actually – dancing in particular ballet is extremely bad on the human that. form because yeah. what we're doing is we're <laughs> it's, yeah, ballet so sounds like it's the opposite the of what you're talking about like with crossfit it's like you want to do something the right way strong ballet seems like you want to do it the wrong way and hard <laughs> 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 flexible though exactly at least flexible. exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, you don't too much mobility in life, you need stability, you need stability. And that's one of the another, uh, one of the philosophies of CrossFit is quarter extremity movement. In fact, that's, that's actually pervasive in several different uh, disciplines, not just CrossFit, but yeah, quarter extremity. Yeah, I guess I never thought about it. I mean, Brittany has had a lot of, um, Max's girlfriend is a ballerina, and she's had a lot of injuries. I mean, that your ballet career, like, ends pretty young and you just become a choreographer you like you can't keep up with it that's crazy yeah it's there's certain sports absolutely. where it's just like catered for <laughs> like a young body i guess destroying I a useful you, useful body destroying yeah. a youthful body <laughs> but yeah she's she's okay but it but it does seem a little strange because she is so incredible and a, a lot of ballet, ballet dancers are dancers in general are incredibly flexible so you sort of get this idea of, oh, they're fine. And then they all have like, God, their ankles are just backwards. And they're, you know, there's, no, <laughs> there's, there's no nothing. And it's just Absolutely. surprising. I feel like Brittany would be good at CrossFit, though, because of that proprioception thing. Like, she can see someone do a movement and then copy it exactly. She'd probably crush us in, it, in a while. Well, thank God she'll never try it. <laughs> She doesn't want to get too bulky. At least, at least the body yeah, weight one. Yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> it's hard because then you have to start factoring different things like is the sport in the lateral? Is it always throwing with the same arms? Is it always is it always swinging with the same thing? And remember what I said is that your body wants to be worn down symmetrically. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, one side's gonna get tighter, one side's gonna stay looser, and it's gonna uh contort your whole body and your form and how you walk and how you sleep and you don't want that you want to be nice and even for as long as possible throughout your life and i know you haven't been practicing like before computers probably but like do you think things have gotten worse because of how society's changed and what we're doing uh follow-up question do you see like thumb or a hand problems with people because of phone scrolling all the time great that's a great question i'll start with the second part now people's thumbs seem to be okay in particular though what can happen with thumbs is that that fascia that i was talking about before on your arms is actually like glove so all of this will cinch down as your arm gets tighter and tighter 
that fascia will come and work around right here on your thumb. So sometimes when you start getting that tension in your arm as it starts binding down, it'll pull on that fascia, which will be right here, which can manifest as thumb pain sometimes. Furthermore, as this binds down, it might shift like your radius out of position through here. And once a bone is out of place, it's gonna alter the full uh, kinematics and functionality of that joint. So thumb, not necessarily, but back to part one of your question, computers, hell yeah. So what's <laughs> happening is that we're already spending a lot of time in this forward position, whether we're driving or eating or computing or watching TV, and it closes everything up like this. So all of this fascia on the front just starts locking you down through here. So now all the, the muscles on your back and the fascia there are trying to pull you back. So before you know it, you've got this tug of work going on that's not tugging, it's just more like cinching down and you're at a complete impasse. And that can manifest in a lot of ways for a lot of different people. It can be like migraines, it can be shoulder pain, it can be low back pain, all of that. We should all go back to being farmers, I feel like. Well, then we have some sort of repetitive use issue from <laughs> hoeing. <laughs> <laughs> Hoen. Uh, do you think about like longevity in general and like is the average person gonna survive or or just be healthier longer if, if they're really focusing on keeping their fascia doing this and keeping themselves in line or is this more of just like a keeping you comfortable now all the above yeah absolutely when you see some of the our older uh, people in life and they're like this and they've got the downer hump and everything like that. That's just the, that's the end result of all of this cinching down for your entire life. Um, so yeah, we need to keep it moving and it doesn't necessarily, as long as we're doing any moving. Okay. Yes. CrossFit's great. But even if you're going and just going for a walk after you eat dinner, that's fantastic too. Something to make sure that our body isn't just slowly locking up, locking up, locking up. So the thing that uh, happens with connective tissue is that uh, it's this thing called thixotropy. So when it's nice and warm, everything glides around. But then as you're sitting there setting chair for long enough, it starts binding, binding, binding and locking. So that's why we want to try to prevent that because as it starts locking, it's going to start pulling in different areas as you start to move around. So movement just move do something is better than doing nothing um my least favorite movement is a burpee have you ever <laughs> do you have any experience with burpees <laughs> oh i've done one or two you could say <laughs> what excellent segue i gotta tell you about this thing <laughs> yeah yeah so actually i'm the the creator and director of an annual uh, burpee challenge called the burpee mile basically what that is is i gather a bunch of friends as one of the values of the burpee mile is community so we all get together <laughs> we do a burpee broad jump in the sand for one mile so what that looks like is there's a start line you burpee broad jump out a half mile then you burpee broad jump back again so that equals one mile it's a, I, I like to say that it's a mindset and fitness challenge because believe it or not, the fitness aspect to it, I can guarantee you, you guys can do it. And even if you're starting to feel pain or discomfort while you're doing it, it's all, you're just there for the community and to train your mindset. So you don't have to do the burpee broad jump the whole time. You can just walk um, mm -hmm. a few steps after you do a burpee broad jump. I've had people scale it where they'll do like, five burpee broad jumps and then uh, lunge 100 meters or something like that. So it's completely customizable. But the RX is the burpee broad jump forward uh, for a mile. Yeah. All right. What percentage of people are doing it RX? Do you like, do you have an idea? Ah, yeah, I would say probably to be the first timers, maybe like 25%. But then here's this really cool thing because you can do it in teams and you can do it obviously individual scaled and you can pick your own scaling as well. But I can guarantee you this, especially with teams, but as you scale it too, you'll finish it and then you'll sit back, you'll reflect upon it and then you'll say, well, I guess I actually could have done that. And that's, that's the nature of it. So then the next, the next year I get more people doing RX because 
because it's manageable. I mean, it's less than two hours worth of work. And I know that we've all gone and done exercise two for more hours? than two hours. You know? I was thinking two weeks. I thought we'd break this up over like <laughs> the first half of November. Oh, God. I'll see you at Christmas. I like it. I like it. The sand is what gets me. That's crazy. Is it the like loose sand or are you on the hard? Uh, what are your knees like after? Great. Yeah. It's the loose sand. So it's a kind of a trade off because you're not going to get the same the force production ratio as if it was hard sand, obviously, but it's softer. So you can kind of just fall Damn. into it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so so soft sand is better. Trust okay. me. Okay. Well, when are me and Max showing up to this? It's in Hermosa. We have to go. <sighs> <laughs> I say that with the Right. Well, the here's the thing. Here's the thing. I've had it now. This would be my eighth year doing it. Um, but because of this whole COVID thing, I didn't get any permits to do it on the sand. So this year I'm doing this thing, uh, it's kind of special and different. We're doing the virtual burpee mile. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to register and you'll get a t-shirt and you'll get a swag bag, which will be a box, a swag box. Um, and what you'll <laughs> do is on the same time, it's on, <laughs> on Saturday, uh, December 5th, Everybody will start at the same time, regardless of where you are in the country. So on the West Coast here, we're going to start at 9 a.m., noon on the East Coast, and everything therein. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, what you're going to do is you're going to take 5,280 feet, which is the feet in a mile, and then take your height plus two feet, and then divide that 5,280 by that number. I know that sounds like crazy, and think about it right there. So just think about it like this. Say I'm, I'm basically six feet. So then I'm going to add two feet to that. So that's eight. So 5,280 divided by eight is only 660 burpees, which is not a big deal. Oh, you do it in place. Okay. I was like, <laughs> what, is, what is this math? I got it. I got it. 660. Yeah. Right. Oh my goodness. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. You, you can do it in place or if you have access to some sort of small yard or even yeah, a small just beach it. or whatever, but we can't do it in large groups. You can go back and forth, you know, over like Oh, I'm doing this. Meters. I'm just definitely forth, doing this and, and filming it. Yeah. Man, I feel like taking out the broad jump would it makes it more attainable somehow. I don't know why. The the broad jump is what scares me. Probably because like my feet barely leave the ground. I'm not the most athletic person. I I'm just stuck to the earth. <laughs> <laughs> You're too dense. That's what it is. It's all all the muscle keeps me down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so wait, December, what, yeah. what day was it again? I'm, I'm obviously making a note. December? December 5th. De December 5th at 9 a.m. And you can also check out my website, theburpeemile.com. Amazing. Yeah. I hate you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I hate it. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to set up accepted. a live stream video for you to check my form for the entire 700 hours that it takes me. <laughs> and i'll be watching <laughs> oh we didn't ask the one question max oh, do yeah it. sorry how do you incorporate alcohol into your training oh well personally that's pretty easy i haven't drank in uh over two years whoa so, congrats but, but i do uh, thank you it wasn't um a conscious so, so decision, intervals actually. this has been a two-year <laughs> interval kind of like <laughs> now he's gonna drink for two years straight yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you, there was, it, it was easy to just, like come home and have a beer or two. And then before you know it, you're doing that like six days a week, which yeah. isn't like, I'm not getting a buzz. It's yeah. just more of like a habit. And then with that yeah. comes like inflammation, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, and then it can also jeopardize how I slept. So, so yeah, it's been, it's been two years now that I haven't drank, but, but I, but I used to drink. So <laughs> I know, mm -hmm. I know all about it. He's, he's <laughs> Oh, when I did you, want to talk about this. Have you ever adjusted somebody that you know is hungover? Yeah. And like, can you feel them toxins moving around? It smell a little bit when you crack you them. Smell, it's yeah. like a liquor cabinet. Sure. Yeah. Well, I it's I wouldn't say it's not a uh, contraindication to adjust somebody if they're hungover. It absolutely is if they're still drunk. So I mean, there's going to be a fine line there, and that's going to be on the the doctor to make yeah, that okay. call um especially because if somebody's been waiting to get a treatment for if they, people will wait like a month to come and see me and so most of the time people understand not to show up like like buzzed 
Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, so I wouldn't adjust somebody if they were if they had any alcohol in their system and they were slurring or any sign showed any signs of um, intoxication. But I mean, as far as like uh, uh, being hung over, that has to do with like electrolyte replenishment and then uh, dehydration. So. So, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to, it's going to, even like the whole treatment itself, the way the suppleness of the muscles are going to feel, it will be impacted too. So I would just make sure that they get really, really hydrated, you know, yeah. at least some people will have people drink in between, in between adjustments if they need to. Sure. So Nate talked to me about sleeping position and I, I did want to talk about it on this podcast because we had eight sleep on and they were like, yeah, we did a study and people who sleep on their side, their left side specifically, sleep best. But he has um, a different opinion on this and I, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. The most optimal position to sleep in is on your back, without a doubt. It has to do with the structure of your body. <laughs> Cue my prop. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of those. So as you sleep. It's in here. <laughs> yeah, we all do. Yeah. <laughs> So you've got natural curvatures of your spine, all right? And when you sleep on your back, this is when they're the most supported. When you start laying on your side, what happens is two things. One, this, cerv this cervical uh, lordosis up here will start kind of bending. And you don't want that because if this gets bent, when you stand up, it's going to alter the whole uh, function of your spine as well, okay? So that's just the bones. What also happens when we sleep on our side is that when we sleep on our side, we don't sleep like this. We end up sleeping like this and also usually like this, okay? So from the front, that looks like not this, but this and this, yeah. okay? So that means that all of this is being held in this short position for hours and hours while you're sleeping. That that when you stand up, basically whenever you hold the muscle in a short position for long enough, your brain says, okay, you want to short, we're going to stay short. So now it's going to be shortened like this. So when you wake up, you're going to have this shortened position, which is obviously going to impact how your shoulder feels, which is also going to impact how your low back feels and over here and then hip and all of that. So basically what I would say, what I had already said before about how our abnormal rushes are leading to our inevitable demise, this is absolutely one of them because this is going to be pulling us down into this position like this. Okay, so, right, okay. So, so I would say don't sleep on your side. Don't sleep on your side. However, what does happen is that we've trained, we've spent our entire lives training our body on what's comfortable, okay? So what we've done is say, when I sleep on my side and do this, now I can sleep, okay? And you spent your whole life developing that. So it's going to take time for your body to understand when I sleep on my back like this, this is comfortable, okay? Furthermore, because we've already have all of this stuff built up in our body, that's why you have to come and see a qualified person such as myself to open up. Then not to out you as a psychopath or anything, but I've heard that- <laughs> Not that the Burpee Mile didn't do that. Yeah, right? That you don't, you don't sleep with no. a pillow, is that true? Or you suggest people not to? That's a great question, actually. So what I do recommend is actually, especially in the retraining of your body, taking a towel and rolling it up lengthwise. I actually happen to have one right here. You'll take a towel, fold it lengthwise like this, fold it in half, and then roll it up like this. Maybe throw a couple rubber bands on the ends of the towel to hold it in place. Rubber band here, rubber band here. Now you're going to take this, and you'll put that right there. And that's going to support your cervical lordosis while you sleep. And the back of your head should be on the mattress. And it's actually an extremely comfortable position. And then furthermore, what you can also do to really make sure this is even more comfortable is then further take a pillow and put it underneath your, your knees. Mm -hmm. And that will kind of relax all this and put it back into neutral. And this is actually a very comfortable position. It's easy to fall asleep with this. Doing it, doing it tonight. Do it. Yeah, I'll try it. I'll call you at 4 a.m. when I'm just like, I don't, I can't. <laughs> How's my form? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, FaceTime me at 4 a.m. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for talking with us. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here.
it's just fun. Like, yeah. And where can the Fitheads find you? You got a fire Instagram for them? Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, my practice is in Redondo Beach. <laughs> Beach City Sports Chiropractic. And I'm on Instagram at Beach Sports Cairo. That's it. Beach cool. Sports and the Cairo. Burpee Mile uh, address um, again. And that's me. And so, yeah, it is theburpeemile.com. All right. Sweet. Well, thank you so much again. And thank you to the Fitheads. And we will see you next week. Thanks, Fitheads. Thank you, guys. (laughs) 